संकीर्तन की जाए श्री श्री गौर नित्यानंद की जाए श्री श्री गौर गदाद जी की जाए श्री श्री गौजी गोपाल की जाए श्री गौर आदमाग की जाए गौर भक्त वृंद की जाए गौर प्रमाण सो गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल वेलकम अगेन बैक एंड टुडे एंड टुमॉरो वी विल बी हैविंग द इवनिंग Q and A, as we announced, among ourselves. Mm-hmm. I'm not streaming the lectures, although I will be sharing eventually. But the idea is to keep our particular group here and address any questions you may have or any topics you may like to hear about, whether in connection to what we have been speaking during the mornings in our Japa retreat or not necessarily. Somehow, everything everything has the absolute as the center, so it's always. Interconnected, it's so it can never be totally out of the loop, if you will. <laughs> so, I don't know. Are there any questions? Something you may like to ask you about? <coughs> to Marty. Um, you mentioned the other day that there's different levels. Corresponding levels of mental level. 
Yeah. I don't remember having said that, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and it's a legal idea, no problem. <laughs> there are levels of bhakti, of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically. Maybe it's, sorry? Maybe it's different levels of practice with bhakti. I yeah, yeah, I don't remember either, but. Different stages of practice. So, which will be the question? <laughs> if you could speak about the different stages of bhakti and the corresponding stages of Oh, I see. Okay, so that I'll briefly reply to that, but that can take because we should do it. We should do a study of the whole Madhurya Kadambini. <laughs> the Lord Chandra already did that very comprehensively. So <laughs> he already got stole that mercy for himself. And so I, I cannot take that back for me. So <laughs> but basically, the idea is just the the point that I wanted to make is that. That there are stages, no? That this is like a crown. Rupa Goswami uses the word crown. Mm -hmm. Crown means like step by step or sequence. No? In, in Upadha Samrita, he uses it more than once, like two times at least, to make this point. Like again, this is not something that no, yesterday you were. Sometimes we can see if you you were a karmi and now you are a redeemed bhakta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> something like that no? but there are some stages in between like everything in life I mean you are there are stages everything is de be developmental if you will um, so my main point was that no like don't try to conceive the spiritual journey as a as a one-shot injection or whatever no? and I received the magical formula and I'm there or something it's a process you may have received everything on day one but to take advantage of all that came in day one may take a lifetime. You know? <laughs> and after a lifetime, you start to realize, oh, that thing that I received on day one, wow, that was it. <laughs> and you won't be so sure either, no? because at that stage you will open to, maybe it's more than that even. No? So, so of course there are stages in bhakti and different, different um, acharyas have the, presented them in different ways. Of course, the most well-known one is the nine stage pro uh, sequence that Srila Rupa Goswami presents and that Vishwanath Chakravarti further unfolds in Madhurya Kadambini. Hmm? Shraddha, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajani Kriya, Nartha Nivriti, Nishta, Ruchi, Asakti, Bhava, Prem. Which is again a way of describing the whole thing in nine stages. It's not that only there are nine stages. No, It's not like you go to a flat and you have nine floors so one two three four five nine prem okay and they're in between stages sometimes the, the the elevator might get stuck in between two flat two floors and there's another stage <laughs> and it may go down oh, what's going on <laughs> whatever so even even uh, Vishwanath Chakravarta when he explains the nine stages he won't say there only one there's only one variety of each one of these stages but there are nuanced two types of ruchi and and like this now each stages will be subdivided when he goes to prem okay let's now speak about nine developments of prem no sneha man pranay rag anurag bhav no sorry what i'm missing one sneha man pranay rag anurag bhav mahabhav seven sorry say nine seven so and, and in mahabhav you have further development so the point is there's a lot of ground to cover, no? so don't be in a rush, don't be anxious about uh, We should not. And the natural idea that is cur immediately is the sense, what you are doing in day one, as we always make this point, what we are doing in day one, that's what we are, act well, maybe not day one, maybe day two or three, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> those things that we receive, even in the beginning of bhakti, in one sense, are those things that will be accompanying us in perfection. In day one, you are chanting. In eternity, you were chanting. In day one, you have Sadhu Sangha. In eternity, there is Sadhu Sangha. So my point is, of course, between one and the other, there will be a difference. Not necessarily because of the quality on the other side, but on the quality of how you are embracing those things. But from day one, all the elements will be there. Sadhu Sangha, Namkirtan, Bhagavad Shravan, Mathura, Bhastri, Murtir on some way or another, no? at least you will become aware of 
of them and gradually they will become more uh, more comprehensive more comprehensive presence in your life so so but with this i'm making the point even though that what you will be doing all the stages will be the same externally <laughs> in one sense there may be some details but generally mostly we will see devotees in strada sadhu sangha they will be still chanting still standing devout and still worshiping Srimurti, still having sadhu sangha actually doing that even more and more and more internally externally also maybe more in quantity but especially internally more in, in quality being linking with that so my point is if those things are there from day one till eternity <laughs> it's of course natural to cons think of them okay but all of them all of these practices one of them being chanting but everything else will take a different shade or face according to each stage because you are actually getting closer to them if you will <laughs> or to advance you're realizing what they actually are. You are getting closer to this idea of, oh, again, Nam is not different from Bhagavan. Oh, Bhagavat is not different from Bhagavan. Oh, Sri Murti is not different from Bhagavan. Oh, my God. I'm thrown into a pool of absolutes. <laughs> no? All these practices are more than what I thought on day one, again, and I'm realizing it now. So, but that was the point. On one side, externally, it will be always the same, mostly, but internally it shouldn't so that's one point second point again there will be stages although externally it's the same internally it shouldn't and it shouldn't because there are stages and you have to go through those stages to discover uh, a new phase of all those things and uh, what comes to mind also apart from the s clear sequence described by Vishwana Chakrabar Thakur and Madhurya Kadaminis what Mahaprabhu gives very interestingly in the in the Sri Shikshastakam, which is basically that when he's describing eight verses which correspond with the nine stages of bhakti. And that was a an insect shared by Srila Bhakti Notakur. Before Bhakti Notakur and his son Modana Bhashyam, his commentary on, on Sri Shikshastakam, nobody conceived of the Sikshastakam verses as uh, representing each of the stages and he'd say many other things as well he mentioned that in the first verse seven glories of the name I mentioned and the remaining seven verses of Sikshastaka and explain each of those because all of them are also corresponding with different uh, stages and he explained each of the verses in connection to the Ashtakaliya Lila also the eight periods of the eternal day in his Bhajan Rahasya and many interesting contributions but one of them is the eight verses speak about the nine stages no? first verse speaks about Shrat and Sadhu Sangha second verse about Anartha Nibriti and Bhajana Kriya third verse about Nishta fourth verse about Ruchi sixth verse about Asakti I skip one verse sixth verse right mm -hmm. uh, five, four, fourth verse about Ruchi four fifth verse about sorry Asakti sixth verse about Bhava and seven and eight about Prem. Seven Vipralamba Prem and eight Sambhog Prem. Of course, we already did some detailed study of that some years ago. You can go there for more, but <laughs> uh, but he's basically saying this and eight, in, in each one of his verses, basically Sikshasakam revolves around chanting. So our Guru Mahesh explaining his incredible commentary on Shikshastakam. He's trying to make this point. Now, each one of the verses, it's all revolving around Srinam because the Shikshastakam begins with this, like, invitation, Param Vijayati Sri Krishna Sankirtanam. Uh, supreme glory, super, oh, great, su supreme victory to Sri Krishna Sankirtanam. And then whew, comes the uh, unfolding of what that's, what's the implication of that. <laughs> so then comes second verse, now, when Mahaprabhu, as we say, is mentioning no? Appre showing appreciation for the name, that's, and in the be beginning verses, Sadhu Sangha and, 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 and Shraddha. Shraddha in the sense of supreme glory to the holy name. That shows some faith. You now you have some faith of, about the, the supremacy of the name. And when you say Sankirtanam, remember, Sankirtan means Sangha Kirtan. So that speaks about 
you start to realize the importance of Sadhu Sangha. And then the second verse will have to do with Anartha Nivriti, Bhajana Kriya and Anartha Nivriti, where you are practicing, you are appreciating the, the grace of the name, so many names, so much Shakti, no hard fast rules, but Anartha Nivriti. Do Daiva Medvishami Hajjani Nanura. But I don't have attraction for that because of anarthas. Anarthas mean, Durdaiva means I'm unfortunate, mm -hmm. and anartha means false sense of wealth, which is another way of saying unfortunate. <laughs> unfortunate. No fortune. Even worse, because you think you have fortune, but it's just like counterfeit money. No. <laughs> anartha. Artha means wealth. Dharma, artha, kamo, artha. Anartha means you think it's wealth. You think you have something value you can you will obtain so much through that, but you will go to jail. Uh, if you try to get something with that counterfeit stuff, no? like if you have one million counterfeit dollars, but you don't know it's counterfeit, or even worse, you know, yeah. and you try to, <laughs> but you don't know probably, and you're okay, I will buy a house and a car and go to, to Guanacaste. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Krishna may, may make an arrangement in that case. But Yogamaya will cover the people. In the <laughs> <laughs> but if not, you will go with 100, 1 million counterfeit dollars. They will say, this is counterfeit. They call the police and you're in jail. And you're like, oh my God, what happened? Five minutes ago, you have so much, so many hopes and all. And now I'm in jail. So, so that's because of Anartha. So Mahaprabhu is representing us by saying... And artas again are like the holes in the container. So, so much mercy is in the name. Three lines of appreciation of that, but the mercy is leaking through the holes. And I'm like, where is the mercy? Where I'm? What's going on? So, so somehow that could be the the spirit of chanting in those stages. Now, proper acknowledgement, proper appreciation of the name, but of the glories and so on, but. Still, <laughs> I don't have the attraction I know it's possible to have, and I acknowledge why. I, have, I, have, I, I, I engage in a very thorough, comprehensive exploration of why I'm not attracted to the name. It cannot be the name failing. Again, it cannot, we cannot doubt the absolute. Be careful of having that filter thing lingering. That No, no. So why in them? So you're having that integrity that's all part of the life of a sadhaka in that stage while chanting mm -hmm. and of course next stage will be third verse nishta nishta means firmness firmness is it yeah. steadiness. steadiness and kirtaniya sadahari third verse which implies constantly engaging in, in chanting but constantly engaging in chanting is not just like you are all day are krishna i'm nishta I have chanted tomorrow. I will chant one lakh. I'm in Nista for one day for tomorrow. <laughs> it's not like that. You have to be Nista with, with other things as well, like Sunichi na Sahishnuna Amani na Manadina. When you have Nista with those while chanting, that's that's real. Nistita, bhajan, kirtan, hmm? humility, tolerance, respect, hmm? love for anonymity. You see. <laughs> No, not caring for a spotlight on your head. So you have to be, have nishta, steadiness in those virtues accompanying your chanting. Again, it's a lifestyle to accompany our chanting. It's not just chanting. It's not an, chanting is not an isolated function in our daily schedule. <laughs> no? so now I chant and I do so nicely everything. Ah, end of the chanting and I'm a totally different person <laughs> or something like that. Silasya no? Maharaj will say, in the beginning of practice, that can happen. No? We may not be able yet to to connect the dots. And he will say, Kanishta Bhakta will go to the temple. And in the temple, will be like, Jai Doji Gopal. And it seems like you're melting in front of the deity. And you're like, oh, Jai. And, then he, and I'm not making a show, but somehow you feel down something. But you cross the, just the boundaries, the Tatashta line from the temple, outside of the temple. And you are a totally different person. You start to do ordinary things and behave like, like you never been in a temple, <laughs> or to speak five minutes ago. <laughs> no. So s still there is this like dichotomy, like, but you were in a temple and you were behaving like that. and behaving. So was that a performance or was that out of mere social custom? And what's going on outside? What's going on is who are you of the two? 
and you may like mm, I'm the two it's possible no it's not possible you have to integrate <laughs> so gradually you start to understand oh okay that the temple is not the temple only I should be able to live as if in the temple always everywhere so going to the temple helped me to realize that and so I conduct when I leave the temple conduct in such a way that I don't leave the temple <laughs> and carrying the temple with me inside of me and my house is an ashram that's the idea it's not just that ashram is shelter so here is an ashram but hopefully you have a good dose and injection of ashram experience so you go back home and you go back ashram no back home it's all how you see your place if you see your place as my place my house when I can do what I want nobody will know in the temple <laughs> and it's my place for my pleasure garden or whatever idea I mean you yourself are creating a hole <laughs> in the ashram in the container there but if you treat your home as your ashram that's they change the whole thing as if you treat your wife as a Vaishnavi that's one thing if you or your husband or whoever you know, if you choose to see them in ordinary terms that will change the whole picture so it's all about which lens you want to put when dealing with you know, others house and so on so sorry I, I don't want to go sidetrack just going back to the point but it's a whole lifestyle that's my point so the third verse is very interesting because saying that okay you want to chant always but that means the always you will conduct yourself in your life with these values and virtues as well because if not, that constant chanting may be even an evas evasive mechanism to not be humble, tolerant, respectful, <laughs> and so on. So that's Nista and chanting in Nista. Again, chanting in this different stages is not only what happens when I sit to chant in that stage, <laughs> but what happens during my whole day in that stage, basically, it's, which are the symptoms of that stage, each stage. And, and that applies to chanting, and that applies to everything else. And so on. No, then will come Ruchi, mm, what that's Mahaprabhu say, that's that's in somehow the dawning of pure devotion, no selfish desire. Basically one is even not interested in samsar, in transcending samsar, which means I'm not interested in samsar. No, I mean because many people is not interested in transcending samsar because they're interested in samsar. <laughs> but and in Ruchi you are not interested in transcending, in even transcending samsara, because you are interested about what's happening beyond samsara, beyond transcending samsara. You know? And you have so much ruchi, ruchi means taste for bhakti. You know? So your chitta, your unconscious, but has been so much cleansed and spiritualized by spiritual samskars that there are no more like material impressions, material desires sprouting. And whatever comes from bhakti, you have, oh, you can perceive all that without the filter of material contamination. So you have such a taste for that, that anything else have any taste whatsoever. <laughs> really, you don't need to force anything. It's just like, wow, no, how the sea level of the name is more valuable than all the universes put together with their proposals and so on. So that will be the chanting in Nist in Ruchi. <laughs> Try to imagine, no? Just a little bit more on the other side of the of the hill. Still, we may be going on the upward upward. You say journey, as Guru Masha, my Guru Masha likes to say, this journey is upward till you reach Nista. Nista is the top of the hill, and then you get to see what's on the other side of the hill. Now, before you are just trusting your mountain guide. You now, like on the other side of the hill, there is a very beautiful <laughs> valley, but you don't see anything. And you have to go upward, a long journey, upward. No? So you are like, hey, I trust you. And he's showing you pictures of the valley. <laughs> I've been there and coming from there, back and forth. I brought people there. So you, you choose to trust me or not. So we are trusting upward, upward, upward. Oh, my God, it's getting long. Upward, no problem. So you get to Nishta, and it means you get a glimpse of the other side by constant practice. Again, the practice in Nishta is so determined and, 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 and uh, steady that it suffocates all different material desire that may be still lingering there so they don't have a chance to sprout so they don't render any 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 further opposition if you will so there's not filtering and you can see oh what's my ultimate prospect so my grandma will say you get to the top of the mountain that's nista 
and you see the valley of friend, the valley of love of God down the mountain, down the hill. So now the rest of the journey from Nista to Prem will be down, downhill, mm -hmm. not uphill. Uphill, you say? Mm -hmm. So up, downhill is a little bit quicker. You will have more mm, speed. Mm -hmm. Still, you have to do the journey. <laughs> you cannot just jump from the hill and reach the valley. You, you do the work. It may take time. It may be a little bit for moments. But it's downward. So, so that will happen in Ruchi, you know, so much taste will be there in chanting and in performing any devotional function. And then a sakti, you know, which Guru Maharaj will say, in Ruchi you are attached to the practice of bhakti, to chanting and all the angas of bhakti, you are attached to that. As you are attached, as Guru Maharaj will say the other day, you know, he quoted this prayer from Jiva Goswami, Oh Bhagavan, as a, as a young boy becomes naturally spontaneously attracted to a girl and vice versa let my mind be in that same way attracted attracted and irresistibly mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. so that in ruchi happens towards all the limbs of bhakti irresistibly attractive to chanting again it's not that you are struggling to finish <laughs> you are struggling to wake up and do something else no? as we must all say no? it's difficult to stop you have so much taste, you cannot stop. No? Imagine it's like if you can have ice cream for eternity. <laughs> 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 That's joking. No? No, I don't want to reduce the glory of Harinam to ice cream. No? <laughs> ice cream prashad, for sure. No? It's still not the same, but if you have an eternal stomach for ice cream, you make it just like... No, no I, I constantly have a taste for that. Of course, it's not proper example because I'm sure if you eat 10 kilos of ice cream at one point, you say, I don't want more of that. Please stop there. <laughs> I'm filled. No, this is famous verse in, in the Bhagavatam. Bhakti parishanu bhav virakti ranjatra chaisa trait kaitya kala prapadya manasya jatasmata sustusti pusti kshuda payonu gasham. That's another way of speaking in sequence. He says, the Bhagavatam 11th canto saying, there are three stages, bhakti parishan ubhavi raktir, too, like a thermometer to prove your progress. Devotion will increase, in realization about God will increase, and detachment from all that is not that will increase. No. All of three simultaneously. Attachment for, attraction for the practice, attraction for the object of the practice, and detachment from whatever is not that, if you will. And it gives the example, It's like if a hungry person starts to eat, and three things will occur simultaneously. With each and every morsel, the person will experience satisfaction. Mm, this is tasty. Pushti, like nutrition, like strength. Oh, food is coming, energy. And shud apayo, which means eradication of hunger. The three come at the same time. No? It's tasty, it's nourishing, it cancels hunger, if you will. So in the same way, by proper engagement in bhakti, devotion comes, hmm, like some taste for that, some strength comes, and detachment from whatever is unfavorable for that. So all the things, again, in root you have a taste for bhakti. Hmm. And in asakti, the next, sta is next stage, you have an, an attachment, not for the practice of bhakti only as it's in Bruchi, but now for the object of the practice of bhakti, Krishna. And not just Krishna, generic Krishna, but a specific, unique type of Krishna corresponding with your dawning spiritual identity. In Asakti, you will have a glimpse of that, because as our Guru Maharaj likes to say, our material identity depends on our attachments. You have certain attachments, and that's who you are. You define yourself according to your attachments in conditioned state. So we could say the same applies to spiritual identity. You will be defined according to your spiritual attachments. <laughs> so anasakti is attachment proper. The word means attachment. So that's a stage of spiritual attachment, which means spiritual identity will start to manifest clearly. Before that, you may feel... I may have some taste and some even affinity in one direction or the other, but in a sakti you actually see who you are in that particular identity. It starts to come. And then you graduate from sadhana. And again, all this has to do with the chanting. No? You are chanting from that perspective, 
from that sense of identity, from that sense of self, and so on. With that attachment for the particular form of your istadev, if you will, in which you want to serve for eternity. And then you graduate from sadhana and you go to bhava and prem. So in bhava, there is another sadhana called bhava sadhana. You have to start to practice by nourishing all the ingredients that will conform your eternal, your siddha deha, your eternal identity. You know, on that stage, of course, certain guidance may be required and, and, and some other things. And of course, the natural revelation will be in, in themselves quite uh, clear about where to go, what to do. And bhava means, as you know, emotion, or means, in this case, ecstasy. So you may imagine how is the chanting at that stage? Well, pretty ecstatic, <laughs> to, to say the least. <laughs> no? I mean, again, if you study what Vishwanath Chakravartakur says in Badurya Kadambini, sorry to go to that work over and over again, but that's the work in that sense. And he will mention the devotees chanting in bhava, and he will have spurtis of Krishna, and Krishna will reveal to each one of his senses he will perceive the aroma of Krishna and the sense of smell will collapse. He will perceive that this, with the touch of Krishna and the sense of touch will collapse. He will have it put the darshan of Krishna and say some psych with collapse. So he will like whoosh, coming back and forth, back and forth. So, as I say the, the other day, those will be your rounds on that stage. No? So don't ask him how about that. How many rounds? Did you finish your round today? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? That's not that's not the place to ask. <laughs> <laughs> they finished their whole sadhana stage, so they are graduated from sadhana. So they are in another world altogether. You know, Bhava is the, the dawning of prem. Prema so what is Sudha Sattva Vishesh Sadma Prema Suryam Susamya? But is the first rays of the sun of prem. Here comes the sun. The horizon say that. No, here comes the sun. <laughs> So we can say, of course, I'm not saying that the song is about Bhava Bhakti, but <laughs> we can use the title for a moment. No, Bhava is an, an, an announcing, here comes the sun. And the sun is Prem, and of course, you can imagine what Prem is coming. If Bhava was ecstatic and all the things were happening in Bhav, Prem is a condensation of that. So how that will take place? And of course, it's so intense that Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur said, you will need another body in dry beginning from the lila being born in the womb of a gopi and receiving bhakti samskar from nitya parishats ragatmika brajavasis so you can deal with the intensity of the developments of prem that come after prem so at that point you need another birth <laughs> something like that <laughs> because it's too much what will be coming through your chanting through whatever you you will be doing and we see that in the life of of these great personalities, mm -hmm. they they practice, but as we say today, you no, know, you will be passing from one emotion to another. You will be carried away, transcendentally, into a sea of an ocean of pratipadam purnam brita swadhanam sarvatma snapanam Mahaprabhu is saying regarding those higher stages. At every step, you will be relishing the nectar of immortality. And Sarvatma Snapanam, your whole being will be bathed by that experience. You, that's a real immersion. We are trying to be immersed here, but real immersion forever, <laughs> that's Bhav and Prem. So, so again, we could say the symptoms that characterize those stages basically are the ones that will be experienced through chanting. No, it's not that there's some separate way of describing the chanting in each stage which is somehow different from what has already been said about what's going on in each stage. Because again, the chanting and the rest of the day is one and the same thing. <laughs> no, the idea is that whatever we experience is hopefully, again, not only while chanting or not only while not chanting, <laughs> but it's like a stream, gradually becomes more established. It's not that, oh, I only chant, and only when I chant, I feel something nice. The rest of the day is crap in my devotional life, no. And hopefully not the opposite either. Oh, when I chant, this crap. But when I stop chanting, oh my gosh, so much joy and relief is coming because of stop chanting. <laughs> oh my, please no, don't do that. Just right now. Anyhow, some thoughts. I extended myself a little bit, but for more, <coughs> Lal Chandra is still waiting for us there with Madhuri Kadambini and so many other ways also waiting there. <laughs> 
<clears throat> Something else? Any other question, topic? Kishore. Sure. Um, in different parts of the lectures, you talked about how Bhakti Rasa is full, but always expanding. Mm. Um, and that expansion through new, specific, unique services. Have some insects nearby. Why one minute? They will assist you. They are covering your, your back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so always expanding, huh? And that expansion is uh, facilitated uh, through new, specific, unique services. And so I'm kind of thinking of the two sides of the coin. The devotee has a desire to render a specific service and Krishna has a desire to receive a specific service mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering if one of those comes first <laughs> one leads the way or if the mutual mm. differs for each circumstance mm. Mm. yeah I say I get the point Do you follow the question? Yeah. So basically saying, at one point of our practice, we may have a desire of offering some specific service to Krishna. And maybe from the beginning, but probably in a more deep, comprehensive way that will come in time. In the beginning, we may be just be told what to do, if you will. <laughs> but eventually that will mature into our own, again, individuality, coming to the fore by the influence of bhakti and inspiring us in a certain way so maybe the question is okay that means that you want to offer some service to Krishna and Krishna will accept that or that means that to begin with Krishna wanted to receive uh, that service from you and that's why you are inspired to offer that something like that? Yeah, yeah. something else I was just like, which one is pushing it? Which one is pushing it? Which one is pushing it forward first? <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I see. Well, of course, there are ways to speak about that. As we say these days, uh, we will we could say that to begin with. Um, again, there are ways of speaking about that. For example, I'm going again to Madhurya Kadambini for a minute. Also. We could say, okay, Krishna is calling first and that's why we are trying to call him now no you can take that stance no like we are chanting not because it was in our original plan okay i will dedicate my life as a devotee that was not in my agenda at least a few decades ago <laughs> but it was in someone else's agenda so we could say it was in krishna's agenda of course if we get more specific we could say <coughs> as vishwana chakravartakur says krishna has like how to say, delegated mm -hmm. his Kripa Shakti, his mercy giving potency to his devotees and they have their own will, if you will. So Bhakti Shakti or Bhakti Devi, we could conceive of Bhakti in personified terms as we do as personalistic people. <laughs> and uh, so Bhakti Devi has her own volition, if you will, and expresses itself through the medium of her agents, if you will, the Vaishnavs, no? because uh, again, we, and that has a lot to do with Bhakti coming to our lives, that's the point Vishwanath Chakortakur is making there, that, okay, you may have your will, and you may have never have, cho will have chosen Bhakti for yourself, but the Vaishnavs have their own will, so their will meets yours, <laughs> and maybe you were not thinking about that, but the will comes with certain, hmm, how do you say in English? Potency? Yeah, of potency and certain like, I'm trying to find one word that uh, it's not coming now. Uh, let me see. With certain, yeah, I, I'm not finding that. Impression? Like impronta, I'm thinking. No, no, that's something else. Huh? Okay, it's kind of certain, yeah, let's say certain intention and certain particular way of expressing itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And again, you may not be thinking about that, but it just crossed your wheel and like, okay, I'm there. <laughs> so, because the question is, okay, what's first? But if I, if we agree that in the beginning, we may not have an, a clear idea, I want to offer this service to Krishna. No. So at one point I may have that desire, but it's first my desire. Krishna wants that way. We could say before you having that desire, you met the sadhus who, through their will, mm, engaged you in bhakti and eventually you have a desire because of being engaged in bhakti because of having crossed the will of the sadhus. <laughs> so in that sense you can say first is their <laughs> their will. It all begins Krishna Bhakti Janma Mohai Sadhu Sangha says Krishna Das Kaviraj The root cause that gives birth to bhakti is Sadhu Sangha. So if you want to go into that if you will initial moment we could put the the initiative, if you will, on that side, the kickstart on, <laughs> on Bhakti Devi's agency. And of course, we that came to us, we somehow uh, accepted that, embraced that. And okay, we have our own will expressing itself in the context of Bhakti now. But again, if, even if we have some desire to do something at a certain stage, mm -hmm. we can go back to the beginning of that, and that's always the initiative comes from prerogative comes from bhakti so if you want you can make that point uh, and by that initial impulse uh, injected if you will in sadhu sangha by bhakti of course our will will become informed by bhakti samskaras and it will express itself in the form of i like to offer these and that services in particular and, and in a legal way of course because of course sometimes our desire to offer a service maybe still mixed with some whatever no? I would like to make a I don't know a rock band that makes only Nirvana songs but all with Maha Mantra <laughs> <laughs> so I want to offer that to Joji Gopal <laughs> okay but <laughs> still there are, there are some there's some mixture there you follow the point no? so <laughs> but we could say that when some devotional inspiration comes and in, we in, in which through which you want to offer yourself through that particular action in a selfless way uh, again that's your will being informed and inspired by Swarup Shakti who came on its own will initially <laughs> but then it's you expressing that and of course Krishna if that's coming from a legal place if you will <laughs> course Krishna is how to say forced in, in, in a natural way forced by attraction of love to oh, no, so he himself has the desire to to receive that and he becomes thirsty for that desire you have that's how it works if it's again pure desire because he's not touched by no, by making a nirvana band with maha mantra no that won't reach Golok. with sorry for that <laughs> I said that because I've seen one video of one devotee once. They were singing all one album of Nirvana, and this whole the songs were Hare Krishna, but with the l melodies, and they're like, Hare, Hare. I was like, mm, I don't think that fully, fully divinely inspired, with all respect. No, I wouldn't call that Jukta Vairagya. Anyhow. <laughs> Okay, I appreciate you are trying to dovetail your an artist and your musical rajasic tendencies with something in connection with, but don't cheat yourself thinking this is the same as, as something Japa or, or whatever, no? <laughs> so, so my point is, that's how it works, no? In, in the beginning, of course, initial impetus from bhakti, you take that impetus and makes form, purifies your will, and eventually you may some wish the desires will come that's the idea that's an important point because of course sometimes unfortunately I've seen some devotees thinking that there's no place for that no? there's no place for desiring to offer a service to Krishna that's selfish or that's your own concoction and not necessarily I mean it can be <laughs> but not necessarily I remember mm, this book interesting one from Purnachandra Goswami, unspoken obstacles in the path of bhakti, interesting one. And he was 
mentioned that he was speaking. He's a proper disciple. He left his body already, and he was speaking about talking to others, to other um, devotees, and, and he will ask. So, what service you would like to offer to Krishna? And the devotees will, this particular devotee will cry. And he say, "Why are you crying? Because nobody in my life asked me that. <laughs> I was never like offered the chance of expressing my will." In accordance to Krishna and so on. So, so the point is there is place for that, and when you have that that desire, Krishna will be forced to to accept that. By he wants that, like Yashoda has. I mean, of course, another example need to see that. But Yashoda has this, as we have been sharing, this like burning Batsalya prem, this extreme desire to feed Krishna, take care of Krishna, I mean, do all the things that the mother of all mothers will do. She has so much desire to offer that. No? He won't think on, in terms of service to God, but she's offering herself for his pleasure. So he has, she has so much that desire that Krishna is bound to reciprocate with that. He's to, he becomes totally obsessed, if you want to put it like that, <laughs> with accepting that from her and reciprocating. You know? So the, 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 the will of the devotee, Bhagavan follows the will of the devotee, if you want to put it like that in that case. You know? Where, it's not that whatever, that's what Madhu, Madhu, Vishwanath says in Madhura Kadambini, it's not that wherever Krishna goes, Bhakti has to go. He will say, wherever Bhakti goes, Krishna has to go. He wants, he's happy to just like, Radhikar Prema Guru, I'm a sister Natan. I'm a dancing puppet in this school of Prem of Sri Radha. I'm in her, wherever she goes, I go. However she dances, I dance. In the Srimad Bhattan, he describes the devotees Nirapeksha Munisham Tam Nibai Ram Samadarshanam Anubra Jami Ham Nityam Puja Yetyang Renu Bihi. So he says, My devotees are free from all selfish desire, they are peaceful, they are very so sober. Uh, they see you, everyone equally, and then he said, uh, I perpetually follow in their footsteps, hoping to be bathed by the dust of their feet. That's Krishna speaking. That, that's his own mode in regarding to when he sees devotees like the Brajavasis offering them, wanting to offer themselves in certain way to him, and Krishna is feeling like, I just my my aspiration is to perpetually follow them and, and be bathed in their foot dust. Like in play, I'm a servant of them. I just live to 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 reciprocate to satisfy their demands. You know, I'm just living to to make their their wish come true, come become true basically. No? That's that's what Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says in in, in Chaitanya Charitamrita. No, I, I can't recall Krishna Satyakari Pritya Bancha something else. He said, the only business that Krishna has is to fulfill the desires of his devotees. He has no other business. He lives for that. And he's, of course, happy to do so. So we can conceive it in that way. In one sense, we could say the devotee is taking, Bhakti is taking, Bhakti is taking the initiative before you are not a devotee. <laughs> and then you are a devotee, so Bhakti is taking the initiative through you as a devotee. <laughs> So it's always bhakti taking, if you will, the lead and Krishna following. That's our unique conception. No? It's not Krishna taking the lead. No? It's bhakti taking the lead. Radha taking the lead. Krishna is following her. Krishna is worshipping her. <laughs> no? As we always say, it's not about God here. It's about love for God and love, which is what God himself worships. Love is the prayogen, the, God, the goal of life for us. And prayer, goal, love is the prayogen for Krishna. He has prem, prem for his devotees, but Prem can always be attained in a higher way. So it always remains a further goal to attain. So that's the interesting idea. Prem is such a, a comprehensive goal of life that it's even the goal of life for God, <laughs> not only for ourselves. <laughs> so that's the power of bhakti again. God himself says, I want that. That's my goal. And we will say, oh, that's my goal. Well, that's the goal of everyone. That's the goal then. If that's the goal for everyone, without exception, including God, that's the goal of life. And Krishna will say, yes, yes, that's the goal of life for me. That's what makes him appear as Mahaprabhu. 
he wants to go further into his exploration of Brahman. It's not enough what I'm experiencing as Krishna. Let's try it in, from this vantage point. Still you know, trying to go deeper into his own goal. So, so we could say that, basically. There's a way to... However we may take it, we will always uh, be biased towards Bhakti. <laughs> they be key chai. <laughs> okay. Something else? Some last question? Sorry for conditioning your last question. Yes. 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 Uh, so I was, I was looking at the Pentecost block or something, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the thing that I was always confused about is that it says that Mahaprabhu is, comes as a form of the, of the devotee and then Advaita comes as an incarnation of the devotee. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see what, what, what was the difference. Like what, what are they trying to okay. delineate there? Okay. So he's mentioning this famous verse when when uh, pranam, man, pranam is offered to Panchatatta, Panchatattan Makam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Sarupakam Bhakta Avataram Bhakta Kyam Namami Bhakta Shaktikam. So that's the beginning of Chaitanya Charitamrita, the last verse of the Mangala Charan. So there the five features of Panchatattva are mentioned with some defining hmm, quality. Uh, Panchatattva Atmakam. No? So, pranam to panchatattva composed of these five truths. Hmm? Makam krishnam, bhakta rupa, sarupakam, bhakta avataram, bhakta kyam, namami bhakta shaktikam. So, of course, a detailed exploration of that. My Guru Maharaj wrote the whole book about that yeah. called Sacred Preface. But in brief, regarding to your question, I think what you said, you find some little, not contradiction, but confusion about mostly these two yeah. incarnation of a devotee like um, in the form of a devotee yeah. bhakta rupa yeah. bhakta avatar yeah it sounds like the same yeah, yeah it sounds in one sense of course all of them are are the same <laughs> <laughs> but they are different and but are the same but they are different no? unity and diversity bit a bit no? because there are five pancha tattva means five truths literally or five aspects of reality of high supreme reality is the absolute in five features the absolute and his shaktis and his expansions and his divine descent so as we know Mahaprabhu represents Bhagavan himself the Godhead the source of everything else mm -hmm. then Nityananda Prabhu is Balaram we already spoke Baladepunim about the principle of Prakash and Vaibhava Prakash and Prabhava Prakash the expansion no, the, the first expansion to begin with in the spiritual domain no? like Bala did in Braj the, uh, the other self of Krishna in the Braj, in the spiritual world and further expanding in by Dwarka, in Mathura, in by Kunta and so on so that's connected with Nityananda mm. and then comes maybe the, the, the point to clarify Bhakta Avataram Advaita Charya mm. so Incarnation. Sometimes the word incarnation is used. I personally prefer not to use that because incarnation may convey the notion of incarnate you know, flesh. Carne means flesh. So, like entering flesh. No? But actually, for us, this is not the idea of avatar. Avatar, actually, the very word avatar means from up, avatar, crossing Tara from up to down. Like implying. That, that divine descent is up, comes down, crossing, but not being touched by the down, not being in flesh. No problem if you want to use the word incarnation, but specifically it's not conveying what's actually taking place with the avatar. So avatar has to do with, of course, Mahaprabhu is Bhakta Rupa, he's God in the form of a devotee, but also he's known as Bhakta Avatar. Gore avatar. Yeah. <laughs> so there may be some overlapping there. Of course, technically speaking, Bhagavad Mahaprabhu is avatari. No? Avatari means the source of all avatars. No? But he's called avatar because avatar also refers to divine descent, no? to the principle of the absolute coming into this world. So in that sense, you could say Mahaprabhu is descending, Nityananda is descending, <laughs> every member of the Pancha, that one more our divine descent if you want to call it like that but 
Bhakta avatar or, or avatar per se is tied to Advaita in this case because Advaita Charya is uh, connected, the identity of Advaita Charya is connected with Mahavishnu. Mm -hmm. So Mahavishnu is that aspect of the Godhead and again it may sound a little bit complex with the ones. I'm familiar with all these terminologies and names and so on so bear with me. <laughs> But it is said in Shastra that through Mahavish, Mahavishnu is that aspect of the divine that mostly through which all the Shristi Lila is unfolding, all the creational experience is coming, all this, the realm of Maya Shakti and Jiva Shakti in connection to Maya Shakti, all this is unfolding from Mahavishnu. So since Avatar means a descent from the spiritual world to here <laughs> and Mahavishnu is the deity if you want to put it like that that is administrating the <laughs> material creation from which the jivas are coming without beginning <laughs> and so on uh, all the avatars that come into this world somehow do so through the agency of Mahavishnu mm -hmm. because Mahavishnu is like how do you say monitoring the material creation so something from transcendence comes to material creation without being touched by it somehow to say that it's going through the i don't want to say the customs of <laughs> mahavishnu <or something. laughs> but the point made is mahavishnu is administering this this section this aspect of the god because it's dealing with this section so whatever comes into this section somehow is doing so in the connection with the deity who is uh, presiding over that, which is Mahavishnu. So in that sense, since Advaita Charya is Mahavishnu, he is connected with Avatar, because not only because Advaita himself, we could say he's descending from up to down from Nitya now is here, <laughs> but because he's been Mahavishnu and through Mahavishnu all the Avatars are coming. In that sense, the principle of Avatar is connected to to him. No, as a member of the Panchatat, but only, mainly to him. Again, it doesn't mean that all the others are not coming from up to down. They are coming also. But Advaita is Mahavishnu, and Mahavishnu is, again, presiding deity of material creation, and through his agency, all these divine descents are coming. So all avatars arrive here through Mahavishnu. So that's why he is mostly connected with the principle of, again, avatar. And again, of course, the remaining ones are got other pandit connected with Swarup Shakti, Bhakti Shakti, she's Radha herself in Gaur Lila. A lot to say about that. <laughs> and Sri Bas Pandit is represent the principle of Tatasta Shakti, imbued with Bhakti, you know, the perfection of Jiva Shakti in connection to to devotion. So brief brief words about Panchatattu and that particular mantra. For more information, I sent Sumati to read Madhurya Kadambini and I sent Lakshay to read Sacred Preface. <laughs> There's always some homework to do, apart from the one already given in the retreat every morning. <laughs> this is the evening homework. <laughs> so, okay. Sumati, two burning questions of the question. The question can be quick. Let's see. That's, that's a short question, right? <laughs> Again, the quick questions are the ones who demand the longest answer. <laughs> so we'll leave it that for tomorrow. Because tomorrow we have Q&A and tomorrow will be the day before Janmasthami. So that will be more appropriate to continue building up to that. Because it may take some, some time. But you start tomorrow. When I say any question, you raise your hand quickly and remind me about that. Really. 
So we'll stop here. Srila Gurudev ki jai, Sriman Mahaprabhu ki jai, Sri Hari Nam Sankirtan ki jai, Sri Dauji Gopal ki jai, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai, Gaur Pramanda Hari Gaur, Vancha Kalpata Rubya Sakya Pasandu Vyayvacha, Patitanam Pabani Fiyo Vaishnava Vyayvacha Namo 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 Namo